थैंक यू आरती थैंक यू नरेश थैंक यू सो मच फॉर इन्वाइटिंग मी वॉट स्टार्ट आउट एज पैंडमिक ब्रेक बिकेम अ पैशन बिकेम मोर देन अ हॉबी नाउ आई एम क्वाइट अपसेस बाई इट इट एंड इट्स ऑल्सो माई रेफ्यूज आई सी माई चिल्ड्रन हेयर बट वन थिंग दैट आई एम इन्वॉल्व विद um is nalanda ve foundation i have a past colleague who is sitting here thank you hari priya for coming um we 17 years old uh, in this organization and a lot of our work involves working with very very disadvantaged children uh and how can we use visual and performing arts to provide them an opportunity for expression provide uh an opportunity to find joy in every space that a child a very disadvantaged child occupies at classroom at home and in spaces in between today um i'm going to share three stories um, three stories um uh, from our field three stories which perhaps some of them may provoke some of them may be quite sad some of them can also be very very inspiring yeah so there's a first story uh, not very uh, far from here uh, in tirwanmur uh, in the tirwanmur government school we run an art uh, studio we run an art lab so one of our programs uh, is uh, running art labs in classrooms uh, for children who study in between 6th and 10th standard middle school children between 10 and 14 year olds and to teach them uh, music dance visual arts all of that so this is centered inside uh, a government school we have now 13 such studios across two boys murgan and suresh uh, they were part of the 8th standard very very excited in music uh, they come from very poor families in the neighborhood very excited about music um, one of our facilitators uh, who taught music in that studio manjula uh, and uh, everybody was so excited about music uh, Uh, and what we find so uh, reassuring is that the more they learn music and the more they're confident to sing they're more confident about education they're more motivated to come to school they're more motivated to come back to learning we saw improvement in mathematics we saw improvement uh, in language we saw improvement in participation in classroom the willingness to uh, find their voice inside the classroom couple of months into the training over 8 9 months we found that both murugan and suresh not very regular to the classroom they they didn't come in um on and off they would come the both of them brothers uh and one fine day they stopped coming uh we we always thought somebody is going to come back we asked their fellow uh, students what why is and they not coming nobody knows an answer after couple of months uh, my colleague manju she suddenly found them on the streets quite close to the school both of them completely stoned and wasted yeah uh they were addicted to ganja and a lot of children today in the government schools and including private schools children as young as 11 and 12 are addicted to substance um and and the more wealthier you get the more sophisticated those substances are today we're not able to find them again after enough uh, um talking to them coaxing them to come and motivating them to come back we have not found them again substance abuse today is one of the biggest challenges that deals with adolescents uh, in tamil nadu kerala especially 
and most other Indian states as well. Story number two. So in one of another art studio, this was an art studio for visual arts where we taught drawing, painting. Uh, this is a studio in North Maras, uh, in a place called GKM Colony. So where every day uh, there would be uh, six classes that are taken for children in the community, other corporation schools and in the school here, they would learn drawing, sketching and painting. Uh, one day, uh, a child uh, walks in, very young child, she should be seventh standard, Veni, her name is. She walks in, uh, she had uh, been absent for three, four days and she quietly walks in and asks my teacher, can I just come and paint today all day? We were surprised and she said, okay, why don't you do this? And then we investigate a little longer and wanting to know. This Veni doesn't have parents. Uh, she lived with her grandparents, grandmother and grandfather. The grandfather was an extremely uh, violent alcoholic. Every day he would just beat his wife, this girl's grandmother. This was like a regular occurrence. One day, this woman has had it enough. She throws a stone at him and that man instantly dies. And the only guardian that this girl had, the grandmother, is arrested. So suddenly, the seven-year-old does not have any guardian. Two days after the death of the grandmother and sudden trauma and shock that has happened, all that this kid wanted to do was come to the art lab and paint. That's all she wanted to do. That's the power of art, of why and why we do what we do. Today at Nalanda Way, we work in seven states across the country. A lot of our work is in majorly in three important areas. One, how can we make learning fun using storytelling, using art, using music? How can we help state governments devise policies, programs on bringing art into classrooms? How can we help governments deal with adolescent concerns and challenges. So how can we make art again, theatre again, uh, be helpful in some things like that. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, when everything was shut and I was trying to uh, find my break in learning weaving, we also did something interesting. So we decided that at this point in time, adolescents, especially kids who the first lockdown was much, much more um, uh, we weren't sure what was going to happen, right? And at that point in time, the 10th standard exams were stopped. And at that 10th standard exams, a lot of these kids, we all believed that this was a couple of months exercise. At that point in time, we decided that we will do an exercise which is specifically towards addressing the mental health and well-being of kids who are taking the board exams. So we decided a program wherein sitting at home, how can we help them de-stress themselves? We decided a program wherein every day a child could call and we weren't sure whether they had a smartphone, whether they had a phone at all. There are 7 lakh kids in Tamil Nadu alone who are taking 10 standard exams, going to government schools. The only thing that we realized was they might have access to some phone, maybe a father's phone or a neighborhood phone. We devised a technology approach which allowed somebody to give a missed call. I don't even have to spend. And a call is placed back and I would get to hear a story for five minutes. And as a part of the story, in the story, kids are talking about the challenges that they're going through during the lockdown. It is quite... Um, um, uh, they, they're talking about their own challenges. It's just about a girl and a boy um, talking about why they're doing what they're doing, their pranks and everything else. It's funny, Rakshita, um, uh, she uh, did all that mono acting sitting at home, she and her brother. Uh, 
sitting at home, everybody is trying to record all of this, edit all of this at home, and we're launching this online so that people can listen to this. We had close to a lakh and 20,000 children listening to these stories from across uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, you would have kids in, uh, uh, you know, in Tirunelveli and uh, um, places like that where they already gone, started going to child labor. And, and some form of labor. And four o'clock, some of these kids would call in the morning and some of them would listen to the stories twice or thrice a day. So it's like 40 days was the entire campaign. And after we did Tamil Nadu, which was fantastic, we decided to scale this across the country. We did, so in Bihar, in Jharkhand, and Jammu and Kashmir, we scaled this entire experiment. We had over 1.25 crore children who would call every day for the next 40 days. And, and some of these children in Bihar, what is most scary, and a lot of these children, their parents are migrants gone to work in Delhi, Gurgaon, and they have not gotten back. And so these girls or boys are living with some aunt or grandmother and still hopeful, uh, scared. And a lot of these stories were their hope. You know? So art is a huge uh, opportunity for a lot of these children to find hope. Uh, when we work with children um, in uh, childcare homes, uh, these are typically for children who are abandoned, uh, who are orphaned. Uh, and, and these children, uh, some of them have had violent past. The only thing that they can come to to find some form of reassurance, some form of emotional regulation, is that when they attempt with anything that they can do with art. I have a last story. And this is a story which is very, very, something very, very dear to me. We run this program called the Chennai Children's Choir. Uh, I have one darling of mine, Rakshita, uh, who is a part of our Chennai Children's Choir from when she was fifth standard. She used to be this small. Now she goes to first year college. Um, we started in 2015, and this is an inclusive choir. Uh, this is children coming in from very disadvantaged backgrounds across the city. And we audition children who have the interest, who are interested in music and willing to commit themselves to a regular program. So they meet every Sunday. They, the training program is between 10 and 4 every day. And we have our directors who will teach them music of all different kinds, folk to classical to carnatic to bhajans to film music to international music. They've done a whole lot of them. And they've performed everywhere. And it's also an inclusive choir. So you have children who are visually challenged. You also had children who are intellectually challenged as well. There's one kid, her name is Anjali. And uh, Anjali uh, is a child on the spectrum um, with very very, very limited language and uh, spoken abilities, extremely sensitive to touch and space. Um, her parents wanted her to just come to the class, not expecting them to sing, not expecting uh, any miracle to happen. She wasn't going to school. She wasn't interested in anything. She would come every Sunday morning. Her mother would accompany her every Sunday would say she would not be interested in anything, but on Sunday, she's the first person to get ready. First three months, I think she just sat. I don't think she engaged. She, she was just around there. After two, three months, she started learning songs. This is a child who will not speak, but she's now singing. She started singing uh, two, three songs. There was a performance in every August. Uh, we, Madras week is conducted. The Madras month is conducted across the city. So one of the inaugural programs happens at the Hayat uh, Regency. And uh, we were, uh, the Chennai Children's Choir was asked to perform as an inaugural performance. I'm there sitting in the front row and our beautiful girls and boys uh, in their Pattu Pavadai and Chattai uh, standing there. And Anjali was part of that performance too. Anjali was standing in the middle. Her mother would sit always 
couple of rows in the front and, and she would keep looking at her mother. Between every song that she would sing, she would reach out to her mother saying, Amma, look at me, Amma, look at me. You know, it brings me to tears every time when I say this. Suddenly this child has found hope. Hope that she is also possible. She is, can be counted. And, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it bawled uh, all of us, including the mother. You wouldn't believe. So in a couple of months, we went to perform at the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. Uh, they were invited to perform at the World Choral Serenade Choral Festival. They were the only children's group in the entire world who were invited to perform. Besides, everything else was adult groups. There was one other children's group who were invited to perform. They were from Syria, but unfortunately, the Americans couldn't process the visa for all of them. So these guys suddenly became the darlings for the entire contingent. Uh, Rakshita was part of that uh, tour and trip. That Kennedy Center is like humongous. It's like some 4,000, 5,000. People can sit there. It's just massive. And at that place, you had all the 25 kids, Anjali in the middle, performing for all of them. But what was interesting is, in the middle of the performance, they, perform, they performed two songs. One was an original composition, and the second was Rabindranath Tagore's Ekla Chalore. The second one, she refused to perform. She decided, I'm not going to sing. She's in the middle. Suddenly, everybody was scared, like, OK, what is going to happen? Everybody, uh, kids were slightly wondering, OK, what if she doesn't talk? She's in the middle. I think the conductor said something very beautiful. She said, if she doesn't want to sing, it's OK. She can be there. I think that whole inclusion and, and why we're doing this is art gets people from different backgrounds, people who can, people who cannot, people who are able, who are disabled, uh, people from very income backgrounds, disabilities, to come together, to make them feel that they can be heard, to make them uh, feel hopeful, and to create a life that they truly, truly desire for them to create. Um, yeah, so <laughs> our lives have been quite uh, enriched by all the children and the beautiful art that they come and make. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. <laughs> In fact, it's very interesting you brought Kerala in with the Kerala government. We, uh, so the biggest challenge today with drug abuse and something like MDMA is, is MDMA is like, I don't know, people family, it's like ecstasy. Uh, so it's like a small tablet and I, can, I don't even have to put it in my mouth. I can just scratch. What people do is scratch their ankle 
and put the uh, pill next to them under the socks. So which means it, it gets into your body without even being obvious at all. Um, and you would be surprised the biggest carriers who are delivering are girls. Um, they are the most uh, not difficult to be, they are difficult to be traced, isn't it? But what we're trying to see here is that in a lot of these behaviors, we see the lack of belonging. Uh, these kids out of their lonely spaces and coming together, then we'll find a lot more opportunity in pro-social behavior. So one of the things that we're doing with the Kerala government is to create choirs in every classroom. So if the entire class comes to sing in harmony, then there are more chances of friendships being made. Singing in harmony gives them hope, confidence, self-esteem, and creates that friendships and pro-social behavior that is going to come in. Uh, in Tamil Nadu, we're trying wherein the entire class is working on a musical theater production. So they're learning life skills, they're learning confidence, but at the same time, they're making them groups. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's tough. <laughs> Yes. My question is uh, my question is around your own practice. So you know you said you can't use to be able to discover. I hear you. I think the mic is not on. No, we don't connect to the right. Okay, so my, my question was around your own art and you know how it helped you during the pandemic. So you said, you know, during the pandemic you discovered this art. So can you share more about that experience? Sure. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so I think personally for me, uh, we were uh, uh, though in lockdown, I think we were reaching so many children at the same point in time. And I think uh, our whole focus was how do we reach and serve at that point in time in the best ways possible. Uh, but at that point in time, I also said, okay, there needs to be another thing that I can do besides work or sitting at home. Um, so it's around, if I'm not wrong, March or April, May of 21. Uh, so I saw that ad in Hindu and uh, enrolled myself, uh, Dilip and Aarti and, uh, and Naresh. Um, so it was a four-day Saori course. Um, but what was very interesting for me, see, I've always been looking to get involved in art. Uh, I've been always interested in art uh, as a Rasika. But it's always that, how do I cross that threshold where I can, I can get that creative confidence. How do I cross that threshold where from, um, you know, I've tried my hand at learning different musical instruments. And every time I learn that, it is terrible, right? The first time you are learning to uh, string a guitar or a violin or anything. And so how do you cross that bridge till you find whatever you're creating is something that you consider uh, happy about. Now, what I found with weaving is that the threshold, especially with Sauri, the threshold is not very far in a way. You could get an output, you could get a result close, sooner. And that was something I really felt extremely uplifting, something that I really look forward to. I mean, um, Haripriya, you do mandala art, and, and I can show you relate to this as well. But one of the things that at the end of, I was so hooked. I was wanting to continue to do all of that. But I didn't know where to go, right? Uh, so I, I remember at that point, I'm Naresh telling me, OK, where do I, f which direction should I go? I am not interested in making fabrics. I'm not interested in making scarves and cushions. And that was not my thing. And I said, OK, I need to make art. So and I think it required that direction from a point of saying, why am I doing and it need I wanted something which allowed a certain freestyle, a certain meditative um, that allowed me to get into a process where I can think while I'm weaving. I don't have to plan and process everything beforehand and work towards it. Um, so Sauri as a weaving process and the loom really helped. But I'm also somebody who is very, very terrible and very good at quitting. So I have quit every different art form, OK? So I did, I, I told myself, if I need to buy a loom, and these looms are bloody expensive. Uh, they're not cheap. Uh, and, uh, and he suggested the most expensive loom. <laughs> um, so I told myself, I will do 20 projects. 
and if I delivered and I completed those 20 projects, then I will uh, I will commit to this. So every Saturday or every possible day I could get time, I would come here and keep doing. And then every time I learned, and, and, and f after the first workshop, then we had a intense, another level of workshop that I did. Um, and there was no looking back. And I think at a personal level, uh, I, I love my work. I really do. But I also felt that I needed something else that gave me refuge. Um, uh, my escape. So, so I have a small studio in my own office, and uh, I think it's very pretty. <laughs> and uh, so that's a lot of my time there. Um, and after that, I think uh, I was also very curious about not just limiting myself to textile art alone. I wanted to try my hand at a lot of mixed media. Um, so as a next step, I went to a course at Penland School of Art Craft in uh, um, in the US. Um, and so that was a one month course that I did uh, in 22. Um, that was quite, quite eye opening and uh, it was another world. Penland started out as a weaving institute in 1920s and it is, it's a once in a lifetime kind of opportunity to go and study there. And that completely changed my own view of things in terms of how a lot of mixed mediums can come together to make art. And, and one led to another and a lot of YouTube videos to help. <laughs> Today I sell a lot of my art. So <laughs> thankfully, yes. Go ahead. I'm Dr. Martini from Ramchandra. Hi. Um, we have a department in the name of Mind, Body, Medicine and Lifestyle. And we also have a program, almost of the same name, where we have one of the courses, Art and Wellness. That's how I came with my students here. Oh, nice. Once for them to have an exp exposure to weaving and also with Dr. Mujunari speaking to them. But the way you put three stories, my, it was amazing. So my question was like, um, being from the medical college, I just felt like, like, do you have like this art form would be good for this person? Would you customize it or it is just at random they have their hands on everything and they finally find out like this is where I can, this would be the one that would either calm me or de-stress de me or make me not go in the right direction, wrong direction or anything like that. Okay, so a caveat, so I'm not the expert uh, in my office, I think my, my colleagues know these things better. But what we don't do is uh, remedial work. We don't do clinical work. Um, a lot of our work is uh, around positive psychology and promotion. Um, so in a sense, so we're not prescriptive. Um, but what we've seen is some art forms working, especially children with intellectual disability, um, uh, children who carry a lot of trauma, uh, children who come from sexual violence. We find anything which uses a lot of texture, um, like clay, uh, uh, something that I can hold on to. Things like those really helping them. Um, um, Texture-based art, um, something that really works. Um, uh, we found anything which is kinesthetic, um, which uses my full body, uh, be it theater or dance, uh, is very, very useful for adolescents especially children who come from high hypersensitivity or um, a, a extreme um, um, ADHD and things like that. Things in, that use my entire body is something that they find very, very useful too. But I, I will leave it at that. I'm not an expert in this. <laughs> Thank you. Sridhar, what brought you into this field? Nalanda um, Bates, Yeah. OK, that's an old story. Yeah, still. <laughs> Sure. So in my past life, I used to work for technology. Um, I used to work in the Netherlands, in the US, uh, primarily selling institutional enterprise software. Uh, 2002, I was in Gujarat uh, to meet a customer. Thermax was my client. It was May of 2002, just um, two months after the Godra riots. I was in Baroda. Um, the riots didn't stop, it, it continued, and Baroda has a long history of communal riots. I think that was my moment of truth, that we're capable of such anger, hate, and violence. 
um, I mean, I'm not getting into the politics of things, but and and communal riots is not unique to Gujarat alone. It, it happens everywhere. But what set me thinking was that as human beings, we're terrible people. From there, 2004 December was tsunami, and and we saw hundreds and thousands of volunteers compassionate and, and giving. So which means then compassion and kindness is what we are born with. Then there is something else that prevents that compassion to be expressed. And I think that gave me hope because then suddenly it meant that it's my fear and ignorance perhaps that's preventing me from showing that compassion. So which means then it's possible. In all of our communal conflicts anywhere in the world, it's women and children who are affected the most. It's They're the most affected. But it's very difficult to work with adults. So you might as well work starting with children who seem to have more curiosity and openness to learn. And we said, we'll start with children. And we'll start with children with the specific goal of looking at the space which gives them the maximum fear the maximum stress. And it, it comes from my own personal experience of having some of the most stressful periods in my life was my school. Um, I think all of us uh, would relate to this of how fear led our education system is and how much trauma that sets in with our children. And how can we use the arts to bring joy even if it is half an hour in a day, even if we can provide that as an opportunity. So that was 2005, December. Uh, I quit and we started now. <laughs> I think Varsha. Uh, I'm Varsha. I met Hi. You a yes. Of times. Yes. Uh, so this is a, a pertinent question because uh, I'm very glad that uh, there is art happening in corporation schools in Chennai. But what is happening is in some of the private schools, it's been it's been removed completely. Yeah. Yeah. So is there something that you can do, you know, as a community, what are we doing for, you know, kids uh, in other schools as well, where it's been completely removed. I remember doing artwork and, you know, needlework uh, yeah. in, in school, but it's not there anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we don't work in private schools, um, and especially the budget private schools, which which serve, um, you know, not so very wealthy uh, children, that's the bulk of all the private schools. They've completely removed it, and especially as you go closer to board exams, there's nothing. And the level of cramming that happens, and, um, you know, what was most surprising, and this is scary, uh, Namakal is known for their uh, factories uh, of schools. <laughs> And um, I was surprised to find one of the most prominent uh, cottage um, factory schools, that correspondent being part of the state education policy. Um, so we're like, OK, this is where the state is going to it. So I do not know. And I think what I also, at some level, um, there is that pressure to compete and perform and to get those entrance examinations. I will also blame parents so much for pushing the schools to remove the softer subjects. You know, what is so surprising, I would even say that when we look at mental health or uh, some of these challenges, it's easier to even talk in government schools. You can't even get to private schools and talk about it. And they would just push it under the carpet. I mean, there's so much substance abuse in private schools. You can't even talk to them inside. They would not even acknowledge that it exists. Um, yeah, I don't know. So the, I think where it's coming from, I'll tell you why I asked you this question. During the same uh, pandemic when you know things were shut, what actually saved me was my needle work that I learned in school. Yeah. And that that was a big uh, source of relief for a lot of people. Yeah. So that is why you know I mean God forbid we shouldn't have another yeah. situation like that. But we're, we're losing the ability to go to yeah. that Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to frighten you a little more. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was in my old school. Just a week ago, we, we sort of, uh, we did a dedication of building for a former teachers. And I met the principal. This week? 
And he said, hey, parent, close from 11th and 12th. I said, what's wrong with it? He said, children are dropping out of school and going to Fiji. Uh, we Jews and Fiji. So Fiji is not in 11th. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. This already in Hyderabad and Telangana, that's a, that's their a scam there. Yeah. This is crazy. What can Fiji provide? A, a kind of word and master of the school? No, they can't. It's just STEM has overtaken everything yeah. else. And without joy of learning STEM Absolutely. too. There is no physics or science or anything. It's no. just, I, I saw a kid. The child is in one of those Fiji classes. He goes to cl our class at 5 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, and gets home at 9 o'clock. His textbook is this big in one subject, this fat. <laughs> so all that they do, because we work with IIT as well, it, all that they prepare you to get into IIT, and after that, they don't tell you how to cope with IIT. They, they, the, the, only, the image is, once you've gotten there, it's done. So all that these kids have learned is to crack the entrance, not learn the subject. Blame the parents. The uh, parents would decide. Right? Yeah, I want yeah. To teach. I don't yeah. think any seven standard kid says, yeah. I want to go home. Yeah, to yeah, to yeah. No, but there's a lot of peer pressure on the children themselves. Yeah. yeah. But it starts with the, with the parents who want their child to be in IIT. And uh, there are, for every seat in IIT, yeah. I think there are some yeah. parents who want their child to get that The worst is not even the child who has the competence to go to IITs. It's the child who is average yeah. and who would perhaps shine in humanities is being pushed to engineering because they have to be seen going to an engineering college. It's more worse. <laughs> hey, Hari. taking mandalas for uh, mental wellness, approaching mandalas from a mental wellness perspective. And what I've observed, I'm sure a lot of these children might grow up into these adults, right? Like, we are, we become so obsessed with perfection mm, and yeah. getting it right the first yeah. time. Yeah. And in one workshop, I see adults wanting to create the perfect mandala that they wanted <laughs> to do. I'm not blaming them, but that's the kind of mindset yeah. I see. And I have to do a lot of talking on how there is power of practice that's involved in it. In it. Yeah. And patience that come, like it's required. Um, so when we are shrouded with so much, you know, obsession for perfection, a lot of judgments that we have around ourselves, we see the same in our art when we begin. And that makes us scared to start, right? Yeah. But it's a journey where you reach, ultimately you stick to it without quitting. It yeah. leads you to self-acceptance. Yeah. So um, I would like your insights on, you know, how, because we're talking about healing through art, I think it's a journey from moving from you know judging yourself and your art and then ultimately landing in a space where you completely accept art, what the art you've created and also yourself. Yeah. So how has your journey been through that? Yeah. Uh, what are all the emotions that you went through in that journey? Love yeah. So, um, you know, first time I sold my art, uh, I was very surprised that people really bought mine. Okay, so it is, the first Bakra I found was a friend. So, <laughs> so she was very proud to put it up in a new home. Um, but what, I mean, it is still, I, it is very scary when you go into typical galleries and artist spaces when you think maybe I'm not as good as them, you know, you're not good enough and things like that. But, but what I've also realized is only when you navigate and move into spaces and get more familiar, get more exposed, is when uh, you develop a lot more confidence. So recently I went to the India Art Fair. Um, and and uh, before India Art Fair was Penland, and when you go to Penland, is when you realize so many uh, you know, amateurs who are coming into learning the craft and art as well. And so you have um, uh, somebody who is artist in the Smithsonian's to uh, also somebody who is new and everybody learning together, which gives that level up. It's, it's not like somebody is in the Ivy Tower, so which means, okay, we're not too far away. Um, but when I looked at, when I went to India Art Fair, when I went to Kochi Biennale, what was most surprising for me is so much textile art there. So when I see so much textile art being showcased, then you suddenly see, oh, textile art is also considered mainstream art. It is not 
so we're not doing something which is for the cattle class. You know, we this is still the bigness. So I think what I found it useful was to go to these spaces, speak to people, then that confidence develops over time. And practice, like as you said, and you need to turn up for your art. Uh, you need to have that discipline to turning up every day. Once you turn up, then the art has a different way of consuming you. <laughs> no, I think the, generally in education, the uh, idea of art teacher will want to take it for extra class to bring out those children who are difficult to <laughs> I think that's what parents have to fight for. Yeah. Point one. Point two, we don't look at art as something we have produced, but an inner awakening, which is the only haven for confidence. Yeah. And without the baseline of confidence, what I am. Yeah. What I am. Yeah. So important. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that. And and especially when um, so we we started a school for uh, children uh, with gypsies, Narikurava, in uh, Shivaganga. Uh, at age 13, the child the first time is getting to a school. At age 13, so which means from 5 to 13, we have children around 120 of them. Nobody's ever gone. So which means the first language that they will learn is art. That's the only way that they can begin to communicate. It is not going to be alphabets. This is how they begin. And I think when we push our kids to learn languages, we were just talking about it just a few minutes ago. It's so important to do that. But we, uh, you know, as an education system, as a state, and everyone, we're consumed in that fear um, of confirming to a certain hundreds of years of uh, scaffolding. Um, we just don't want to get out of it. Nobody wants to break it. A few states are doing it, but uh, still, I, I, I think parents also, I'm not going to blame parents completely because, you know, today 25 year olds are talking about quarter life crisis. Uh, you know, it, it is no more uh, uh, 40s when you are suddenly confused in life and you want to buy a bullet or go to the Himalayas and things like that. It is 23-year-olds and 24-year-olds who are asking, what is my purpose in life? Who are asking, nobody, I didn't ask. I think you just had to work. You worked hard. And suddenly you may find something as you go along or you, are you stuck with it. But kids are asking those questions and today, with such level of exposure and their own intelligence and their own critical thinking, they don't want to accept anything that's coming their way. So which means what I find, I empathize with parents because today I'm not going to work because somebody's expecting me to work. So I need to find it relevant. Today, a lot of companies are finding it so difficult to get uh, employees back into their office. They don't want to get out of their homes. Because it's so convenient, they, they just want to sit with this, no social contact. At that time also, you need to appeal to their purpose in life and all of that. And, and when at that point in time, parents find it extremely scary, if I don't take at least a treaded path, I would just completely go wayward and do nothing. I know of uh, uh, boys today, and, and this is very, very scary in Tamil Nadu, is that uh, adolescent boys after 10th standard, poor mostly, they don't want to learn anything, study anything, work anything, do anything. It is scary. They just don't do want to do anything. The only thing that they care about is having a bike and wanting a girlfriend. That's it. And they're so arrogant that they even have the guts to tell you that after some time, my mother will find a girl for me, I will get married, and that girl will go to a job and take care of me. This is reality, and this is bloody, bloody scary. So I think I empathize with parents when they say, OK, at least get this done before you can do other things. But it's, um, it's a double-edged sword. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I've been asking too many questions. Don't mind this one more. Uh, 
I, I, you know, there is also this, I, I don't use this in a gender uh, form, but art is, you know, more for a yeah, more yeah. feminine thing, while the engineer and the technologist are, you know, yeah. masculine. Yeah. There is a need for a lot of role modeling. Yeah. People like you who are taken up an art form. Yeah. I'd really love to see an R.M. Murthy or a Fringy and Shivnar are actually speaking to me. Even. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. We really need to do that because there is a strong perception. Yeah. I was one of the few in school who took on a humanities school. And we were all considered physics. Seriously. Oh, you're doing history and literature and economics. You know, thankfully one of us not got into the IAS and you know, changed everything. But that was the whole thing why people yeah. who went on to the sciences were considered heroes. Yeah. There is this, that's still there. Absolutely. I, mean, I think that's more of uh, here in India because the Olympic diver Tom Daly, he is actually a fantastic crochet artist. And even while in between his, uh, you know, medal winning performances, you know, he was working with his crochet. So there's a lot more of acceptance of, uh, you know, men doing those things. But I will tell you, Vasha, so I s enrolled in a course uh, by this uh, person, Tansy Hagen. She's a very famous textile artist based in the UK. So as a, it's an online program, so they would give you a set of videos that you do. And there's a Facebook community where everybody doing the course can... You wouldn't be surprised, I am the only man in that entire group. It's a completely international group. There's no Indians at all, but all of them are women. I'm the only man. In fact, when I put up um, a lot of uh, my social medias around art and poetry and things like that, so the, the common referent to my uh, 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 you know, friends who are men who would ask me uh, is, this is not normal, have you become gay? So the, so the thing is, suddenly art needs to be only women or you need to be gay to appreciate or indulge in art. So it is, it is like we see this especially among boys they would be very good in craft and art, but they would stop doing it after six, seven standard because it's girly. So they would rather do sport, they would rather do um, perhaps theater, but they would not do dance and they would not do uh, thread work, needle work, that's all girly. <laughs> The segregation yeah. is state policy. <laughs> British Council started this program uh, which was to break this gender uh, barriers. Uh, girls play football and boys will play theatre. So this entire program is on getting girls into football and them doing theatre. So we do teach yoga. Uh, for us, so when we looked at yoga, it's more from a wellness point of view, from a fitness, wellness. Uh, especially we do this uh, for a lot of our adolescent girls programs, wherein it is, uh, we look at it more as a mindfulness practice, uh, not so much as an art form. Uh, but I mean, I understand uh, the yeah, approach because, that you're uh, looking at. What I feel is breathing is an art. Absolutely. And listening is an art. Mm -hmm. and, uh, to see a thing, like a thing, not 
putting your imagination on. Yeah. Not to, I mean, if you see a plant, you should see a plant. Yeah. Not how is it and what color is it and what, does it have any infection? Like, it's like that. Sure. It's like Jake's point of view. Sure. So, like that, I mean, I'm sure. asking uh, if somebody is helping them like that. Sure. We do use yoga. Okay. I think, Sridhar, the big question seems to be how do we break the ice to say that there should be art in every school, at least up to the middle school, where two thirds of the children engage in mixed kind of arts, not yeah. one like the boys who go to football, next year they will go to this and that and yeah. that kind of stuff. And to bring value to this, thanks to talks like TED Talk, I think they should be projected rock stock parents. Sure, I agree. Definitely. And then I think we need to brainstorm with them, those who don't agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Whatever. Give it to the voice also. No? New economic, new education policy has no mention of Exactly, exactly. It does. Um, yeah, uh, but what they're basically saying is kinesthetic in a lot way. Um, yeah, that's another debate. <laughs> <laughs>